All right, welcome to part two of our series called Made for Great. We're studying a book of the Bible called Daniel. And I just want to welcome all of you who are over at Fishers, all of you at Avon. Uh, We know many of you are with us online. And uh, Brownsburg, it's amazing. It's hard to find a seat today. Uh, You guys took the charge to invite. It is just awesome to see what God's doing here. Well, the series called Made for Great is about the greatness God has planted in you. He's made you in his image. But I should give you a a little bit of a cheat from last week in case you missed part one. We don't achieve the greatness God has planted in us by looking at ourselves or really uh, searching within ourselves. We achieve it actually by submitting ourselves to God and really acknowledging his greatness. It's in his greatness that we find our place, we find our identity, our purpose, It gives us a security in a crazy world. It gives us an eternal life and so much more. So we're going to continue on that journey today. Uh, Many of you know one of my family's favorite TV shows is America's Funniest Home Videos. My kids love it. We love to watch it together and just laugh. And there are a few recurring videos on America's Funniest Home Videos. It's like the same, you know, funny thing happens at every birthday party. And it's when there's a pinata. You know, there's a pinata and someone's got a blindfold on so they can't see and they're wandering around. And inevitably, there's a dad or an uncle who, you know, gets hit. And, you know, he bends over in pain and it's funny. Well, I had seen enough America's Funniest Home Videos to know better. But one of my kids really wanted a pinata at their birthday party. This was a few years ago. The birthday party was in February, so the pinata had to be indoors. And I'm a little bit of an overthinker, so I really thought through, like, how can I make sure no one goes to the hospital? How can I make sure nobody, you know, gets, gets whacked during the pinata whacking? And so I had it all rigged up in the garage. I had a little pulley system. Everyone was a good 10 feet away. What I didn't think through in advance is like, we don't have a lot of sticks around for hitting things. So at the last minute, I'm like, what in the world are these kids going to hit the pinata with? I see an aluminum baseball bat. I'm like, well, hey, you know, desperate times call for desperate measures. Everyone's pretty far away. I think this will be okay. Now, spoiler alert, the story's not as bad as you might be thinking, okay? (laughs) But what happened is, you know, one of these seven or eight-year-old kids, he had the blindfold on, he has the aluminum baseball bat. And he just, you know, sucker punches it right into the drywall of the garage. (laughs) So now every time I go out to my car, there's this huge dent in the wall. And I'm just reminded, like, maybe just don't do pinatas at all. Like, no matter how much you overthink it, it doesn't end well. You know, there are times in life where it's like you've got a blindfold on and you can't see the way forward. When you're a kid and you're playing a game and it's a physical blindfold, it might be kind of fun. But when you grow up... There's times where a diagnosis or a change in the relationship, uh, a change in your work situation, or just in your circumstances beyond your control, puts you in a situation where you just can't see the way forward. I've been there so many times in my life. I remember a time I had left my career as a professional writer to become a pastor, and the church had grown and things were going fairly well, Uh, but then I started to have neurological issues, stroke-like symptoms. And I, I had to be hospitalized multiple times as the doctors figured out. And there was this, this kind of fork in the road where I knew like I couldn't keep doing what I was doing. It was putting too much stress on my body, but I had no idea what the other option even was. And that's kind of the worst when you can't see the way forward. You know that what's, what you've been doing isn't working in the marriage or in the relationship with the child. Or it's not working in your career. It's not working in your health. And yet, there's got to be some other way, but you can't even see it. I wonder, where is it in your life right now that you just can't see the way forward? Where is it in your life? This is just between you and God. No one else is looking inside your mind. Is it in your health? Is it in a relationship? Is it in your career, your finances? Maybe it's some kind of secret struggle that you're carrying with you. And you you just can't see a way forward. I want you to identify that. You know, sometimes in life, we're just one change away from it being revealed what that other path is. I want to show you a video of some little babies who needed glasses. 
And the moment that the doctors and the parents are putting the glasses on, they don't like the change and they're uncomfortable and they're crying. And then the moment those lenses lock in, all of a sudden they can see what they hadn't seen before. I just want you to look at the emotion on their faces. Check this out. Here's what I want to ask you. If God could do that for you today, and it is the heart of God to help you, would you receive that today? If he could show you a way forward where you haven't been able to see a way forward, would you receive it? Uh, If so, I want to give you a very simple prayer to pray right now to prepare your heart as we open the word of God. It's very simple. You can just say it in your mind to God. God, please open my eyes. Please open my eyes to see you today for who you are. Now, I know many of you, you're praying people, and you've probably been praying about that situation. If you're anything like me, your situation where you're stuck or you can't see a way forward, you've been praying, God, show me the way. God, open a door. God, provide. Those are good prayers. Pray those prayers. But this is a different prayer. This is a prayer that just says, God, All I need is you. Would you open my eyes to see your greatness, to see you for who you are? You see, I've learned that sometimes in life you don't find the path by looking for the path. There are times in life that instead you actually find the path by looking for God. And that's my invitation to you as we open God's word is that you would open your heart And that you would look for God, maybe for some of you for the first time, maybe for others in a new way, in in a kind of recovered, revived way. You know, there's three kinds of people, as I've been praying for you this week, I know there's three kinds of people who I want to talk to today, and I can guarantee you're one of the three. Which one of these three are you? Uh, Category one, those of you who are walking with God. You know, you walked in here this morning and you say, I'm not perfect, but you know, I pray regularly. I'm reading my Bible. I'm walking with God. If that's you, you're going to see yourself in the story that we're studying today. Second category, and I hope that you got invited here by someone from Connection Point. If you would say, I'm really not yet in a personal relationship with God. If that's you, you belong here. Every one of us was there at one point and you are going to, in this Bible story, you're going to hear from God today If you walked in here or online, walked into this moment thinking, I I just really don't know where I stand with God. That's category two. Category three, and you know if this is you, you're a person who has encountered God in the past. You've prayed in the past. You've believed in the past. You've seen God work. But if you're really honest, if you're really honest, there's a gap where there used to be a closeness between you and God. There's some things that have come between you and God. Maybe you've wandered a little bit. Right now, just in your own mind, which one of those three best describes you today? And whichever one of those three you're in, you're gonna see yourself in this story. You're gonna relate to these struggles. Last week, we met Daniel, a teenager. He was probably 14 to 16 years old when his entire civilization, the Jewish nation in Israel, this was 2,500 years ago, they got overtaken by a huge global empire called Babylon, or world empire at the time. Uh, This is an etching of Nebuchadnezzar, leader of that empire, well-documented historical figure. Last week, Daniel uh, watches buildings burn. He sees his parents and others either get killed or uh, taken away. 
And then chains are put around his wrist. He's actually selected among the elite students to uh, be taken captive and marched 500 miles to Babylon. Daniel's got three friends and the four of them are gonna go through a three-year process of indoctrination into Babylonian culture. The, this indoctrination is meant for them to uh, forsake the God they used to worship and start to worship these many small g gods or idols of the Babylonian culture. It was an impossible situation and as we continue the story today, we're going to see it get even more impossible. That It looks like there's no way forward. We're going to see how God worked in that situation, how he wants to work in yours. If you said, yeah, I'm probably in category one, you're going to relate to Daniel in this story. If you thought, I'm either in category two or three, I don't know where I am with God, or I used to know, but I've wandered, there's some distance. I think you're actually going to see yourself in the story of Nebuchadnezzar, this king who was not a person of God, was not a believer in the one true God, and yet we're going to see that the one true God was reaching out to him and wanted to reach in his, uh, wanted to work in his life. But Nebuchadnezzar is also going to find himself in an impossible situation where he couldn't see the way forward. Let's pick up in verse 7 of Daniel chapter 1. Nebuchadnezzar's chief of staff renames Daniel and his three buddies. And I just want to cruise over this. We've got a lot of our young people who are about to go back to college. This was too significant for me to skip over. If you're a college student or have one, you might want to take pictures of some of these. Daniel's original name in Hebrew means God is my judge. And part of this indoctrination program when he showed up in Babylon was them renaming him. They wanted to change his identity, in other words. Not what he was raised with, not an identity in the one true God. They changed his name to Belteshazzar, which is one of their many gods in this polytheistic society that worships all sorts of different gods. His buddy Hananiah, that name in Hebrew means the Lord shows grace. They renamed him. They changed his identity on the outside, at least. They call him Shadrach under the command of the moon god. Mishael, his name in Hebrew means who is like God. The Babylonians rename him. This one's a direct insult. Instead of who is like the one true God, who is like the moon God? And then Azariah, whose name means the Lord helps, gets renamed Abednego, servant of Nego, God of learning and writing. Here's the point. There is a cultural current today that is pulling at you. All three of those categories, whichever one you're in, we're all in it together. It's like, it's like a river that has a current that maybe you've inner tube down or canoed down, but this is a white water rapids, okay? There is a powerful cultural current in our culture, in the world, and it is with all its might trying to move you away from God. And the further you get from God, the further you get from the greatness he's planted in you, which comes through a relationship with him and you fulfilling the things he created you to do. So make no mistake, there's a, a cultural current pulling us away. Everything about the authority and the culture where Daniel lived was anti-God. And there's a really a, a realization here when you find yourself in that kind of environment. Many of our students find themselves in this kind of environment. Many of you in your workplace or maybe in your family, there's just no one else who really takes God seriously or takes Jesus seriously. I've been there. I was there when I was a journalist and God really got a hold of my heart and I became an all out follower of Jesus. I was the only such animal in the entire newsroom where I worked. Everyone else thought I had lost my mind. They thought I was like some kind of weird alien thing that I actually believed the Bible was true. When you find yourself in a situation like that, you need to know you've been strategically placed there by God for a purpose. God will carry you through if you keep clinging to him, but he has more in mind than just your survival. He has things for you to do. He had people in that newsroom for me to share Christ with. People in that newsroom who had uh, prejudiced misconceptions about what a Christian was, and I got to prove those wrong with my love and my actions rather than with my words. God has a reason for you being in that environment, but also Daniel had these three buddies. If you're gonna survive in that kind of environment, you've gotta have some other believers 
who are very close to you. And we're going to see these guys pray together, go through crisis together. Verse 7, these four young men, God gives them knowledge. He gives them understanding. So there's a good chance they got in this program and most of these elites, because keep in mind, Israel, the Jewish people, they were not the only kingdom that Babylon had overtaken. Babylon's just devouring different civilizations all around the ancient Near East. And so there's all these students coming in from all these different cultures, and they figure out once they get them there, they're assessing them as they're indoctrinating them, how can we use them? Most of them are going to go back to their home country and be kind of an ambassador, an emissary to help Babylon control the population. But Daniel and his buddies, God allows them to rise to the top of their class. He gives them really almost a supernatural level of knowledge and understanding. And last week we learned that the greatness for which God has created you, he has already woven into you the intellect that you need to do what he's created you to do. You know, maybe not to be a, a world physicist, but to do what he's called you to do. He's given you the emotional ability you need. He's given you the uh, circumstances that have shaped you. He's placed into you everything that is needed for you to fulfill your purpose on earth, which is what true greatness is. Well, Daniel has this special gift, unique to this culture where the king was way into visions and dreams. And so God gives Daniel an ability to interpret those. Well, at the end of their indoctrination time, the king kind of brings them through Graduating classes get marched through the throne room and the king interviews them. In verse 9, as he talks with Daniel and these three other believers of the one true God, uh, the king, who's not a believer at the time, is just amazed. Like these guys are, these are the most insightful, wise, the, these, these young men, I don't want them to go back to Jerusalem as an emissary. I want them to stay here in my palace they're going to make Babylon a better city. Now, Daniel's writing this book. It's biographical, and he's looking back as an old man. And it's interesting that Daniel continues throughout the book to use that name that he was given as a baby that he had for 14 or 16 years in Jerusalem. And then he's going to live decades in Babylon, but in his mind, he's always Daniel. And his three friends, they keep referring to each other by their Hebrew names. There's something in here about retaining your identity as a follower of Christ in a culture that wants to give you all sorts of other identities. Some of those identities from the culture are, are outright evil, but others aren't evil. They're just not your true identity. The culture will tell you your identity is your net worth or your GPA or your job title or your material possessions, or how good you look, or your followers on social media. The culture will feed you, all of us, these lies about what our true identity is. And as followers of Jesus, we have to look to the word of God to say, no, my identity is I'm a son or a daughter of the king. I'm adopted into his family. I'm eternally loved. That's who I am. It's not my career. It's not what the world says about me. Well, verse 21, Nebuchadnezzar is having dreams, and I want you to notice this. His mind was troubled, and he could not sleep. This is interesting when you consider how rich and powerful and famous Nebuchadnezzar was. You could ride a horse in any direction from Babylon as far as you could possibly get, and everyone knew who Nebuchadnezzar was. Everyone knew he was in control. He answered to no one. He had unlimited power, unlimited wealth, but he couldn't sleep at night. You know, some people get everything they want in life materially, but they can't sleep at night. And, and there's a lesson in here that getting everything you desire doesn't guarantee you peace or contentment. Nebuchadnezzar's laying there. His mind is racing about is he going to be overtaken by someone else? Is he going to die? What's going to come of his empire? He has this you know, unthinkable amount of wealth and control, but he's laying there unable to sleep. When I did work in the news industry as a journalist, there were times where I would write a human interest profile. I wrote really long form pieces that I would spend months on. And so often 
uh, if it was a billionaire or a celebrity or a professional athlete, if I was doing a full-length profile on them, they would invite me to their breakfast table. I would drive around in their car with them. I'm literally documenting how they live their life. And as I did that multiple times, you know what I noticed? I noticed that many of those people, I'm not saying all of them, but many of them have less peace than just an average middle-class American. More money, more problems. More fame, more problems. It's really interesting. This thing that you think will bring peace and contentment, there's nothing wrong with being influential, having a large following, nothing wrong with wealth, but it doesn't deliver what we often think it will. I wonder for you, what's been keeping you up at night lately? What's been troubling you? What puzzle is your mind trying to solve and the the wheels of your mind are spinning, but it's like tires in the mud. You just can't get traction. I want you to do a self-assessment here. Be real honest with yourself about the last time you thought this, and it's true for all of us. When I get that, then I'll be happy. When I, get, when I get that degree, then I'll be happy. When I get that person to date me, then I'll be happy. When I get that person to marry me, then I'll be happy. Well, when I get that, that job, I'll be happy. Turns out it didn't work, but maybe now if I get that promotion, I'll be happy. When I can just, you know, get out of my parents' house and be on my own, I'll be happy. Now if I can get my own house, I'll be happy. Now if I can get a bigger house, I'll be happy. Once I get that car or that boat, once we have a child, if we're honest, while we don't have the wealth of Nebuchadnezzar, every single one of us has a trail of dozens of things or circumstances or relationships that if we're honest with ourselves, we were sure it would deliver happiness, and yet they haven't. Here's an honest question. Why is it that no matter how much we strive, no matter how much we achieve, no matter how much we succeed, or for some of you, some of you have had a windfall of some sort, an inheritance or some kind of payout, and you just receive this like, and you got it, and now you look back, You're not really any happier. Why is it that we all still have these unmet needs in us? We're going to find the answer in this story. So the king summoned the magicians, all these counselors that he has, and he asked them to tell him not just the interpretation of his dream, but what he dreamed. Look at verse 3. I've had a dream that troubles me. I want to know what it means. Well, Daniel and his friends, they're not in this group. There's probably hundreds, if not thousands, of these counselors. And whoever was on rotation that day to go in and talk to the king, it wasn't Daniel and his buddies. So verse 4, all these advisors say, King, you know, we love you. We've been trained to be real kind in how we respond to you. But if you would just tell us the dream, then we could interpret it for you. But Nebuchadnezzar, apparently he's been sold enough interpretations that he could tell weren't true. He says, hey, if you actually have a line to the gods and you can actually interpret my dream, then you should be able to tell me what my dream was. It's an impossible request. Don't just interpret my dream. Tell me what my dream was and then interpret it. Then Nebuchadnezzar, kind of going out of his mind here, he adds on verse five, by the way, if you're not able to do this, if you can't tell me what I dreamed and interpreted it, um, I'm, I'm gonna cut you into pieces. <laughs> I'm going to destroy your family and turn your house into a heap of rubble. Not just you, but all of the advisors and counselors who work for me. If you think you have a bad boss, you know, I guess it could be worse. Verse 12. Uh, the, The guys say back to him, hey, this is impossible. No one's ever asked for this. And it just makes him even more furious. So he, on the spot, orders the execution of all of these wise men, hundreds or thousands of them. And of course, Daniel and his three buddies, the four of them, they're part of this group. Verse 13, so the decree was issued. And men, assassins, professional murderers who work for the king are sent to Daniel's home and his friends' homes to put them to death. I mean, this is real. Like Daniel and his buddies, they are moments away from being beheaded or speared or however these guys were gonna go about it. Verse 16 Daniel, when when the guys get there, he knows the guy because they went through training or whatever together. He met him in his indoctrination. He says, whoa, 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 hey, doesn't this seem unreasonable? Would you just let me go back to the king? The guy says, all right, you got like 24 hours, buddy, good luck. 
So verse 16, Daniel goes to the king. The king more or less says you have until tomorrow. Verse 17, Daniel returns to his house. He explains to these three close friends using their original identities in God, not in the culture. And notice what these four young men do. They plead for mercy from the God of heaven. So they're in an evil culture, a broken culture. They're in a circumstance that's beyond their control, but they haven't forgotten their identity in the one true God. They have other followers of the one true God with them. And now they're gonna not just kind of pray, they're gonna plead for mercy from the one true God of heaven. Can I just ask you where there's a, a, a dead end in your life or a situation you can't see the way forward, have you really pleaded for mercy from the God of heaven? When's the last time you got on your knees and you prayed with emotion? When's the last time that you uh, got two or three followers of Jesus and you said, hey guys or friends, I need you, we need to get together to pray. We're not just gonna text each other and say praying for you, that's a good start. There's a time and place for that, but this situation is so urgent. Let's find a time that works on our schedules. We're all gonna get together. We're all gonna pray out loud to the God of heaven. We're gonna plead for mercy for my wayward child. We're gonna plead for mercy for healing from this physical condition. We're gonna plead for a way forward in my career or in my small business. We're gonna plead to the God of heaven. When's the last time that you did that? Because if this verse wasn't here, verse 18, the whole rest of the story would be different. We're gonna see God respond to this, but God's responding to their prayers when he shows up and he meets a need. Here's something we've all gotta acknowledge today. We all have needs that only God can meet. And when you get on your knees and when you, not just in your mind, but you get somewhere where you can with your mouth cry out to God, what it's doing is it's communicating to the universe and to the God of heaven I admit there are things in my life, God, that only you can do. We're told later in scripture that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. It is the unchanging nature of God to respond to people who will be humble before him. So Nebuchadnezzar, a non-believer far from God, he's got needs that only God can meet. Daniel and his buddies, people of God, they have needs that only God can meet. And then all the other wise men who are about to be put to death, they have needs that only God can meet. Verse 19, after this aggressive prayer session, during the night, the mystery was revealed by God to Daniel in a vision. Verse 19 is one of these little verses we could do a whole sermon on. There's two sentences here and there's a pause between the two. And it's so significant because here's what happens in my life. God, I need a healing. There's no way through this. God gives me the healing. He opens the door. He changes the situation. Boom, I race through it and I'm on with my life. And there's some of you, you're sitting here and there was a time when you prayed, God, if you would remove the cancer, if you would spare my life, I will serve you all my days, but you haven't, have you? We all have times where it was a crisis and we did pray and God did show up and then we forget about it. So if I was Daniel, verse 19, as soon as God reveals it to me, boom, I'm straight to the palace, right? Because I'm, I'm gonna be killed. I better let Nebuchadnezzar know. But I just love this. He stops and he praises the God of heaven. There's a principle here. You will unleash your true greatness not by looking in the mirror. You'll unleash the greatness God has planted within you. He's made you in his image by being more concerned with God's greatness than with your own. It's so interesting. Daniel lived a great life, but he did it by being a servant of others and a servant of God. He was never actually after his greatness. Daniel is a true hero of the faith. Here we are 2,500 years later. 
There's a bunch of guys named Dan in the audience. This book of the Bible has changed history and civilizations. Millions of people are going to read this book of the Bible today. This guy achieves true greatness, not by seeking his own greatness, but by seeking the greatness of God and seeking to be a servant of others. Verse 26, the king asks Daniel, all right, you told me you wanted time. Now you're back. Tell me my dream. And if you can tell me what it is, you can interpret it. Daniel takes a risk here in verse 27. (laughs) He says, hey, king, guess what? What you're asking for is impossible. No one can actually tell you your dream. The next verse must come pretty quick because he doesn't want to get killed. No human could do this. But there is a God in heaven who can. Where do you need to receive that in your life? Maybe there is no doctor who can cure that cancer. But there's a God in heaven who can. Maybe there is no therapist who can heal your marriage, but there's a God in heaven who can. Maybe there's no thing you can do to get that wayward child back into a right relationship. There's no human who could, but there's a God in heaven who can. Your career's totally stuck. Your business is totally stuck. There's nothing any human you know could do, but there's a God in heaven who can. For your situation, will you just receive that, will you amplify in your heart and in your mind the greatness of God, that he can do what no one else can do? You know, we saw there are needs in us that only God can fulfill, but also there are desires in you. There are desires in you today and for the rest of your life on earth that no one can fulfill other than the God of heaven. I've been thinking lately about the difference between gratification and satisfaction. You know what the difference is? Gratification is an immediate sense of pleasure. And it's what our culture idolizes and teaches us to chase. Satisfaction is lasting fulfillment. Now, a lot of things that gratify were made by God and aren't inherently wrong, though Satan loves to twist them and use them in wrong ways. For example, a new purchase is gratifying, and there's nothing wrong necessarily with a new purchase. But what our culture lies is says, if you get that house, car, boat, whatever else, have enough in your 401k, save enough, get enough, it will give you satisfaction. It can't. We've all bought enough things to know it gratifies, but it doesn't satisfy. Our culture will tell us success. If you can just get the degree, get the job, get the promotion, it will satisfy. Does it gratify? Absolutely. Will it still satisfy you 10, 15, 20 years later? No, it can't. How about sexual experience? I mean, our culture, this is the God of our culture. To make your body an idol and whatever feels good, do it, and that will bring you satisfaction. Will it bring you gratification for a moment? Absolutely. God actually designed that, and there's a way to use that according to his plan. Yes, it'll gratify. Will sexual experiences, no matter how many and of what variety, fulfill you over decades, give you identity and purpose and security and peace and contentment? They won't. They can't. All they can do is gratify, not satisfy. How about that emotional connection that you're just like, man, if my spouse would pay more attention to me, or if I could find a person, if I could have that person's spouse, or if I could date that person, then I would be satisfied. No, you'd be gratified. There's not a human alive who can meet the needs of your heart. There's only the God of heaven, but the God of heaven cares about you. The God of heaven even cares about Nebuchadnezzar. And he's reaching out to you today. He's saying, I see you. I see your struggle to find fulfillment and meaning and lasting satisfaction. I see you trying all these things that gratify, but then the next morning it wears off or after a year it wears off. Come to the God of heaven. Look to me to do for you what no one else can do. When was the last time you called out to him? Maybe you're in this moment and you earlier said, John, I'm in that second group. I'm just, I'm far from God. I don't even know where I stand with God. If that's you, 
Uh, we've prayed for you this week and God brought you into this moment. If you feel like, John, there's no hope for me. If you knew what I had done, if you knew the shame that I carry, if you knew the mistakes I have made, here's the thing, the God of heaven knows all that and he loves you anyway. He brought you into this moment. This is your chance to get into a relationship with him. If you feel like you've done too much wrong, you've made too many mistakes, uh, can I tell you a little bit about Nebuchadnezzar, who God loved? Nebuchadnezzar most likely oversaw physical child sacrifices to these idols. He murdered countless people just on whims. Like, I don't like them, I'm going to kill them. He literally destroyed entire civilizations. I don't want to make light of your past and what you've been through and what you've done, but I'm pretty sure you haven't sacrificed any children physically and you haven't destroyed any civilizations or killed scores of people on a whim. Can I tell you about the beauty of the cross of Jesus? It's the difference between religion and a true relationship with God. You see, God so loved the world, he so loved you that when you were weighed down with sin, shame, emptiness, the, the struggle of this life, he sent his one and only son, that's Jesus. Why? So that whoever will believe in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. What do you need to believe in? Very simply, believe he died on the cross in your place. The cross, you see people wearing them, you see all sorts of Olympic athletes with crosses on. Why is the cross the center of Christianity? It's what makes Christianity different from any religion or philosophy. It's the difference between you trying to earn your way to God and God reaching out to you in mercy and grace and saying, everything in your life that needs to be atoned for and paid for, my son atoned for it. My son paid for it on the cross. Your shame is paid for. Your sin is paid for. Your adoption into my family, the family of God is paid for. Your place in an eternal kingdom where you'll never get sick or tired or weary is all paid for. You don't have to pay money to a church. You don't have to do good deeds. You don't have to have your good outweigh your bad. All you have to do is be humble enough to say, Jesus, I need your salvation. I believe there's many of you today that today is the day of your salvation. God is a God of forgiveness for those who will repent. And God brought someone here today to hear this. Today, it is not too late to turn back to God. Today is not too late to turn back to God. But I can't let you hear this and walk out without adding that tomorrow's not guaranteed. If I, if I gave you a hope that just said, yeah, don't worry about it, it wouldn't be a biblical hope. None of us know when our last breath will be all of us know at some point in the next hundred years, we'll breathe our final breath on earth. Scripture says it is appointed unto humans once to die and after that, the judgment. Do you know what you'll wake up to after you breathe your final breath? God, and it'll either be a huge relief or a moment of the biggest regret in all of your life and eternity. Daniel's now gonna give Nebuchadnezzar this undeserved gift from God. And if you study it in detail, what you'll see is actually God gave this dream to Nebuchadnezzar to reach out to him. And if you're here and you don't even believe in God yet, you're not in a relationship with him, guess what? There are some desires he's woven into you that are already there to move you toward him. Verse 29, Daniel says, here's what happened, king, as you were lying there, you're thinking about things to come. Verse 30, I'm gonna give you the dream, but also the interpretation, not because of me, but because of the God in heaven. And Nebuchadnezzar, God wants you to understand what's in your heart. Verse 31, Daniel starts to explain the dream. As you were lying there, you looked, you see this huge statue, it's enormous, it's dazzling. Here's what the statue looks like. It's probably about 90 feet tall. The head is gold. This is not paint. The head was actually gold in the statue. The chest is silver. And on down it goes with weaker and weaker materials. And here's how Daniel interprets this dream. The head was Nebuchadnezzar's empire, the Babylonian empire, the gold. It started about 600 years before Christ. The chest and the arms would be the Medo-Persian empire, Darius and Caesar, who will come in at the end of Daniel after Nebuchadnezzar dies. The belly and thighs, that's a guy you've heard of, Alexander the Great, conquered the world. Greek, 
conqueror. The Greek empire essentially took over. The Babylonian empire gets taken over by the Medo-Persians. Then it gets taken over by the Greeks. Then it's going to get taken over by the Romans. But here's what's so interesting about this dream. Verse 34, here's these empires that are going to follow you. But then as you were watching a rock, huge stone was hewn out of the mountain, not by human hands. The stone was thrown at the statue and it smashes the statue. The iron, the clay, the bronze, all those kingdoms get broken down. They get ground into fine dust and they blow away. In other words, Nebuchadnezzar, your great empire is going to come to nothing. And all the great empires of the world are going to come to nothing. Verse 35, the wind is going to blow them away without a trace. But the rock that struck the statue will become a huge mountain and it will fill the whole earth. In the time of those kings, empire of Rome, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed nor will it be left to another people. This empire will crush and destroy all these violent, pagan, wicked kingdoms, bring them to an end, but the kingdom that God sets up will endure forever. Who is the stone not cut out of the mountain by human hands, not birthed by human power alone, but by God? If you've ever heard the phrase, on Christ the solid rock I stand, Christ is the stone. This is a prophecy 500 years before Jesus. And it fills in the chart after the Roman Empire. Did you know it was Roman soldiers who nailed Jesus to the cross? And for about the first 150 years of Christianity, Christians were fed to lions in Colosseums. Sometimes they were impaled on stakes and lit on fire to light the Caesar's parties at night. But after about 150 years, Christianity would so change the culture that a new Roman emperor would say, These Christians are the best thing for society. Rome is now a Christian nation. And from that moment on, Christianity has continued to grow. Today, one out of three people in the world identifies as a Christian. It's about two and a half billion people out of eight billion. It is the largest movement in human history, period. It transcends languages and continents and cultures and nations which rise and fall. Jesus' kingdom is the stone which will eclipse every earthly kingdom. You can take pictures of this. I'll move through it quickly. But Jesus claims to be the solid rock in Matthew chapter 7. He's referencing this prophecy when he says, hey, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There's no way to heaven except through me. And if you want an eternal life and you want fulfillment and greatness and satisfaction in this life, you have to build your life on me, Jesus says exclusively. And he says, if you build your life on anything else, It might look good for a while, but it's like building a luxury home on sand without pouring a foundation first. Eventually, the rains will fall, they'll eat away at the dirt, and the house will collapse. All throughout the New Testament part of the Bible, the the later part of the Bible, Jesus is referred to as the living stone, the cornerstone. Verse 46, Nebuchadnezzar actually falls down before Daniel. He knows it. This was my dream. No denying it. That's exactly what I saw. He doesn't like the interpretation, but he has to acknowledge he's heard from the God of heaven. Look at verse 47. Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and the revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this. Here is the big idea. It's everything that we're learning today, and it applies to all three groups that walked in here. Only when you choose the lordship of Jesus over you, only when you choose that, You bow before him and you say, Jesus, you're not just a good teacher. It's not even just that you're God. It's not even just that you died on the cross for my sins. All of that is true, but you're the master of my life. You are the God of gods. You are the king of kings. And I give all of my life in submission to you. It's only then that your deepest needs will be met. And this is true if you've been a believer, but maybe there's some areas in your life that haven't been under the lordship of Jesus. It's true if you've been as far away from God as Nebuchadnezzar that today can be your day to call out to God for salvation. He will meet your deepest needs. And if you're in that third group that you'd known God, but you'd wandered, let today be the day that you return full-hearted and say, "Uh, Jesus, I'm all in. Be the Lord of my life, the master of my life. 
Nebuchadnezzar's story happened 2,500 years ago, but one of the reasons that Christianity continues to grow in every decade and in every century is that it works. And you can see in our time, people who've had lots of power, fame, money, etc., who tried all the gratifying things that didn't work, those who actually try Jesus, they find that it works. And there are always entertaining stories. This happened with Bob Dylan back in the 70s. It happened with Johnny Cash. It happened with Justin Bieber. One of the most recent is a guy named Russell Brand. Now, full disclosure, Russell Brand's an incredibly crass, out-there comedian who, who has done some really bad things in his life. But within the last year, he's given Christianity a try. He got baptized in April of this year, and I'm not suggesting any of us go follow Russell Brand. We need to follow Jesus and the Word of God. But I want you to listen to him sharing what God is doing in his heart and life. What has happened is he said, Jesus, be my Lord. And you're going to see a parallel to what God did for Nebuchadnezzar. Take a look. There are times when I've told you that I felt far from Christ. This is a verse that brought me back into connection with our Lord. It's from Isaiah. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I've called you by your name. You are mine. My feelings of faith have altered lately because it, I've had the sense that through fear, I might take back my self-will, that I might through fear think I have to be in control of this situation. If you feel that you are being attacked, if you are under threat, it seems, um, it seems obvious rational, sensible to take back control. But the sensation of faith, allowing Christ in his sub-molecular potency, right down to the granular, right out into the cosmological to order all things. For we are dealing with the king of eternity. And this is something I never understood before I was a Christian, that you are stepping out of the cubic reality afforded to you by materialism and rationalism and into a transcendent realm where you are given grace, where once I have accepted sin and surrendered and allowed him to carry me, I'm granted a new freedom. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. I don't belong to myself anymore. And that is true freedom. Let me know what you think about that verse and let me know how you use that to combat and conquer fear. What you just heard was someone, they're new in the faith, but they're placing, they're not just believing in Jesus as one more thing. They're saying he's the Lord of the universe. I'm gonna make him the Lord of my life. You know, you'll never realize your true value. You can search for your identity through experiences and labels and other people's approval, whatever else. You'll never actually realize the actual value that God has placed in you. You'll never actualize the true greatness for which you were created by studying yourself, looking at yourself in the mirror, making life all about you. It's not the path to greatness or identity or security. But you find all those things when you look to God, look at the God who created you and say, God, I'm gonna submit to you as the Lord of my life. I just wanna close this out with a little word for that third group. Those of you who, you've been with God in the past, but it's, there's a gap now, if you're honest. This is what happens to Nebuchadnezzar. See, Nebuchadnezzar bows down and he worships the God of gods, but sometime later, and I'll compress this, but in chapter three, Nebuchadnezzar still got a lot of ego. And one day he decides, remember that statue in the dream? I'm gonna build that, but I'm gonna make it gold from head to toe. And I'm gonna make everyone bow down and worship me. It doesn't go well for Nebuchadnezzar from here on out because there's this reality that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. When we humble ourselves before him, he gives us grace. But when we raise a fist, guess what? We're gonna lose. Nebuchadnezzar ends up losing. He ends up actually losing his mind. Daniel chapter five, Nebuchadnezzar has a mental breakdown in modern terms. He's slobbering, he's acting like an animal. This lasts for about a year and a half. He completely loses his mind until in his heart, he finally surrenders to God. And at the end of it, verse 34, here's what he says to Daniel. I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven and my sanity was restored. You're not gonna find the sanity you seek without looking up. 
Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever, the one who's above all. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the King of heaven, because everything he does is right, and all his ways are just, and those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. So what's the way forward where you walked in today and you thought, I don't know the way forward. I can't see a way forward. Here it is. It's very simple. Repent, submit, and declare the Lordship of Jesus in your life. I want to give you an opportunity to do that right now. If you'd just close your eyes at all our locations, even online, if you'd just close your eyes, I want you mentally to focus on God, have a moment with God. And I want to start by talking to those of you that when you walked in here, you would have said, I don't know where I stand with God. I don't know for sure where I'll go when I die. I don't know for sure where I'm at. If that's you, and if you want to decide right now to make Jesus the Lord of your life, I want to invite you at all our locations to raise your hand up. Go ahead, just raise your hand up. I'm the only one looking. Everyone else has their eyes closed. I'm seeing hands all around here at Brownsburg. Keep them up a little bit so I can try to see you. I'm working my way around the room. I see you. I see so many. And I just, you're an answer to prayer. Today is your day to come into relationship with God. Make Jesus the Lord of your life. You can put those hands down. Here's how this happens. It's receiving a gift from God. And you do that with your heart and your will. So with your eyes closed, or if you're praying this prayer and you want to look at me, you can, but everyone else has their eyes closed. I'm going to pray a, a, a sentence, and then you repeat it. You can repeat it with your mouth, or you can repeat it in your mind. But what matters is, do you believe it? And it is as simple as this. You just pray like this. Almighty God, just repeat those words. I come to you today in need of your salvation. Jesus, I make you the Lord of my life. I believe you died for me. I believe you rose from the dead. Would you forgive my sins? Fill me with your spirit. Adopt me into the family of God. If you prayed that prayer, can I just tell you, if you meant that from your heart, scripture says, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. In this moment, your identity has changed. You're now a child of God. The chains of sin and addiction and shame have been broken from you. You now have an eternal place in heaven, and you now have a place here in the body of Christ. We are your brothers and sisters. We love you, and we want to help you walk in this new life. Hey, as we all open our eyes back up, can we just put our hands together to welcome everyone who made that decision today? We're so proud of you for choosing that. I'm about to dismiss you all, and I just want to invite you back next week, because next week we're going to have baptisms. And baptism, this is really an application for those of you in group one or group three, where you say, I know God, or I knew God, and I've wandered. Baptism is saying Jesus is the Lord of my life. He's my identity. That's who I am. And so next week, join us at all of our locations. Baptism, if you've never seen it here before, we do it the way scripture describes, and it is a celebration. It's a lot of fun. After you place your faith in Jesus, it is God's will for you to get baptized. You can sign up at cp.news, or you could talk to a pastor or anyone you can find there at your location. But can I just say, if you are a follower of Jesus and you've never taken this step, it's my prayer that you would take this step next week as a breakthrough moment in your life of saying, Jesus is the Lord of my life. Well, hey, we love you. I can't wait to see you next week. Have a great Sunday. Take care.